We are recording. Drop that, drop that GitHub in the chat and so I can pull it up. I stuck it in the Colab General. What channel would you like? Um, I'll find it in Colab General. Okay. Put it, put, you can put it in, if you put it in governance, that would be good. Oh. Or just this current chat. I was just going to grab it. Yeah, the Zoom chat. Oh, that. Uh, so be, yeah. Zoom I mean, chat I, gives me the willies because it disappears at the end of the meeting. Yeah. I, I, but you can save it. I can just grab it. I'll well, find, somebody I'll can find. save it before the meeting ends, I guess, but then it's gone. Yep. Well, we pull it up now just to see it. Thank, right. thank you for posting. Yeah. I think it's a good good practice to put links into Discord, you know, as a record or a breadcrumb of the discussion. Because it's yeah, I tend to, to like an unforgivable sin for computers to throw away my work. You know, so if I typed a bunch of stuff into the, the Zoom chat, and then at the end of the meeting, I can't get it back. I'm like, oh, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you were saying, uh, you can start the recording as far as I'm concerned. I did. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, you were saying that uh, Agoric is working with Substrate. I have not seen that. I have seen them talk about Cosmos. This is... Um, uh, Dean Tribble, by the way, the guy you were talking about. Oh, is it Dean? Okay. Yeah. Um, so if I look for Cosmos, yeah. So I know they're working with Cosmos. I had not heard that they're working with. Um... Yeah, with Substrate. Yeah. So I believe uh, it, when you go to the Agoric website, there's a video. Uh, and uh, it's that video on the their their website, which is the, a presentation by Dean Tribble, and he um, he talks about blockchain platforms and. And you're sure it's 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 Substrate and not Cosmos. Yeah, it, it, okay. he, he he he. I don't believe he mentioned Cosmos during the the presentation. Well, there's a lot of videos. Do you know which one? Uh, well, let me, um, let me do a little searching here. I just found a repo at, uh, Agoric slash substrate node template. It looks like it doesn't have too much Agoric stuff in it yet, but that node template is like the way to get started on substrate. It would be, yeah. How do I get to their GitHub from their website? Oh, there we go. Yeah. It, it's called, uh. Substrate dash node dash template. November 2018. Oh, ha, ha. Okay. <laughs> okay. So if you go to the, if you're at agoric.com and you go to about agoric, there's a video called The Duality of Smart Contracts and Electronic Rights by Dean Tribble at Web3 Summit. So that's the video that I watched, and he uh, talks about Substrate. Okay, I'll have to find that. Because it might be that top one that looks like the Web3 Summit venue. Yeah. There I, I was just no, lamenting no. the other day that there's no OCAPs on Substrate yet. Oh. Yeah, we haven't seen anything in the public GitHub anyway uh, on the Substrate in the last year. This is their current work here is the swing set and the swing set on, on Cosmos. What's the swing set? Uh, it's, a, it's a prototype VAT host modeled after the Kikos domains. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with what a VAT is. Uh, probably not value added tax. No. Um, I guess you haven't found time to watch the San Francisco Blockchain Week talk. Oh, I watched that back a week after San Francisco Blockchain Week. I don't remember. Oh, that. okay. All right. Well, it has a pretty good, pretty thorough discussion of what. A, anyway, a VAT is like a. It's a. It's an independent unit of computation. It's kind of like a thread. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also like a trust domain, and you know that kind of thing. Like the whole, the whole um, uh, Ethereum blockchain would be one VAT, and then okay. you know gotcha. each, 
each R chain, uh, um, what do they call them? The pieces of R chain. Uh, uh, shards, maybe. Shards, Names. Yeah, would be, yeah, you know, because the vats, the shards don't necessarily trust each other, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so, and Kikos is one of the um, object capability based operating systems, maybe the, one of the original ones. Um, oh, so the other thing is, that's kind of cool is we discussed this in, at a kind of high level last week. Which repository is it that he's working in? Is it Swingset? Um, there's this really cool. Um, Covered call composed with an, an escrow service, and Mark got it working in their in their. Uh, here it is. He got it working in their new stuff. That was really interesting. The covered call option that we went over last week. This is the actual bits and him getting. Where what planet are we on here? I have too many windows. Um. So this is the 22 hours ago. He's <laughs> this is what he's working on. Um, oh, wait, you can think of a bat as an object where you can't touch anything inside the ob the object. You can't touch any of the variables or uh, anything except through a secured connection. Uh, 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 to, uh, with it, with another VAT and a secure network has secure networks between VATs which can't be uh, externally manipulated uh, except through these secure connections. It's true that a VAT is an object in that sense, but there's more to it than that. It's a, it's a host for other objects and, the, and all the hosts within, all the objects within a VAT sort of trust the VAT to provide them reliable computing services. It's kind of like a, a, a process on, inside an operating system it has to trust the operating system. It doesn't really have any choice, you know. Thank you. It's tempting to try to run this code. I don't know what anybody else wants to do. Yeah, I'd be I'd be down to play with that a little bit. All right, so what do I do here? Oh, this was my SES demo. This might be in. Have you have I showed you this? Anybody? Uh, I'll take that as a no. Um, this is kind of a warm up to the other one. This is like, you know, uh, you know, uh, right, you wouldn't want, so, but this server basically takes arbitrary JavaScript and runs it. Um, and you wouldn't want somebody to be able to do this, right? Uh, you know, or console.log or whatever. Um, so you can't really even get off the ground. Requires not defined. Um, so what kind of stuff can you run in here? Just computation stuff? Right. Yeah. Um, so, and the point is that in, in lots of, like in Python, you can do stuff like, um, and then you can go f dot internal thingy dot stack dot built ins dot open. <laughs> you, know? you can, you can cheat your way around the, the object system and then you can go open let's see password. Right? So Python is not an object capability system. Right? You have to work really yeah, hard. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. It doesn't enforce all the all the stuff. So this is basically JavaScript with the ugly bits turned off. 
that's what the secure ECMAScript. Um, oh, this okay. So what you're typing in there is running in the secure ECMAScript like environment or something. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it starts with server, and then. Um, So the, the actual web server it's, itself, what I did was I took, this is a, you know, how to write a web server it, with Node. Um, you know, totally bog standard stuff. Okay, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I took that same code and then I adapted it to use object capabilities, so now, you can't just import create server. Somebody has to hand it to you. Mm. Um, and so one of the things I did, tried to do was like tamper with the server object and tamper goes, okay, can I, can I swap out what server.listen means? And, and you'll see in the log here, it says, uh, I can't do that. Can't clobber it. Oh, I wondered what that meant. Okay, cool. Hey, Dan, I'm curious, there was a comment at the top of the, near the top of this file that not the adapted from, but the global require. Is, uh -huh. is that doing anything or is that just a comment? That is a convention from like Doug Crockford or whatever, the, the syntax highlighting thing I have. If I don't do that, it will, it will like tell me when I've got undeclared globals. Oh. Oh, I guess I didn't use require. Oh, yeah, I did right there. So I, I'm not. Uh, normally, I do. Okay, my Emacs is all screwed up. So. <laughs> okay, so but in even in the case you expected, that's just for like Emacs and syntax highlighting and stuff. That's not right. Any yeah, right. It's sort of sort of static analysis. Yeah. Um, what's that thing called? Um, what was that thing? He, he, he had like one of the first linters. Oh, well, it's in there somewhere. Uh, less relevant to what we're up to. Okay, so this is actually written using secure ECMAScript, and then to the bootstrap um, is just written using normal. So to, to wrap the create server um, method from, from the node standard library, such that it can be safely used in a, in a secure ECMAScript is quite a bit more work than I expected. You've seen me just you know pass around things to, to grant various things, object, you know capabilities yeah but yeah. i don't like harden them so that you can't tamper with them and stuff and hardening some them so that you can't tamper with them is it means like enumerating each of their methods and securing those and it's kind of yeah uh so where's the actual ses stuff um I'm confused. Oh, I wrote a loader, right. There's the SES thing. Ah. Uh, so, okay, so where did you use that then? Okay. Make SES root realm. Okay. And then they have a make require thing that you can, I think, there, it it makes it so that people either can or can't require console or or use console or or maybe that's when you create the realm. Oh, so okay, so you're like explicitly stating all the things that can be required here, and one of them is a Gora Carden, right? And then maybe some others came from config, right? So then the server, but yeah. So I've got console mode allow. And then, um, uh, 
oh, these are things that the loader needs. Okay, so then I load main and uh, pass create server to main. Um, and yeah, so and then this the, the what the DOR service does is it you know puts up a little web page and if you post then it evaluates the stuff and you know prints it. Yeah, nice. Oh, it makes a little realm just to evaluate that code. How does this thing get its hand on this? Yes. Oh, global. Curious. Okay. I wonder how that works. <laughs> yeah, so you're saying like you never required SES in here, but sometimes how you were able to use it? Yeah. Uh, I guess a, a root, an SES root realm has an SES global. Hmm. That makes a certain amount of sense because there are certain things you just need to be able to like if you're going to, you know, do inception and go to the next level, you have to be able to make another realm. Yeah. Okay. So that was fun. Uh, object capabilities stuff. Now this thing, I have not tried this, but this could be fun. So ERTP is electronic rights transfer protocol. Mm. It's things like purses and, and um, atomic swaps and, or they call them escrow services. Anyway. Okay. So, and then within ERTP we're in, or within here. Sixteen hours ago. Encouragement bot? <laughs> the heck is that? <laughs> You're awesome, keep it up. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, so let's try contract host. Now, how do we run this thing? Um, oh, this is kind of cool. Um, this is his formal description of the protocol. They're working on ways to uh, formally prove that it's doing what, what it has the security properties here after. And that was, you know, front side of one page, which is kind of cool. Um, And this is what it's like to run a, write a smart contract. Um, I wonder if they're going to add the, the async syntax. That would be really nice. They have this JavaScript sub, uh, subscript subset called Jesse. Uh, yeah, I've heard of Jesse. That's that's an agoric thing. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Where is the Jesse thing? Because they have this nice picture of, yeah. Oh, so this, I've seen this a couple times. Yeah, this is JavaScript SGR spoke with all the nastiness out here. Um, and then this is JavaScript strict, which fixes some things about Hello. some weird scoping stuff. So this is if you do use strict, but you still have ambient authority and you can mutate what what array means and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, and then it, secure ECMAScript gets rid of that stuff. There's no ambient authority. No ambient authority. Somebody has to pass me in all the goodies. And you can't screw with the, you know, the basic standard library. Um, in fact, there's no um, mutable global state. Um, and then um, I forget what tiny SES is. 
Oh, I guess there's, you get rid of this and class and a few other things. Now you get tiny SES and then you get rid of function and proxy and realm and mutable properties altogether. And then you got Jesse. This is supposed to be kind of the um, smallest JavaScript subset that is still not a total pain in the ass to program in. Yeah. So when you get all the way down one layer deeper to JSON, you can't even compute anything anymore, right? You just, you just yeah. have data. Yeah, right. Okay. So this is, this is their proposal for, um, for what you should do to write small contracts. The other thing about Jesse is you might not use a, so anything like Node to run it. You might just go write a Jesse interpreter in, in Rust or whatever. Mm. Closure or something like that. So is there a, I guess there probably is, but do you know where like a spec is for that language? Well, this is it. Oh, it is. Oh yeah. Okay. So they, well, there's also a, somebody, um, but let's see where it is. So this is the gram. Yeah, this is the grammar. Oh, cool. It's not a complete spec. Um, there is somebody who's built an interpreter or sorry. Anyway, there's somebody who's working on, sort of running code that exposes the, the little teeny details in the spec. Yeah. And I could find that, but that would take a little bit of work. I would love to uh, add uh, Jesse to uh, robots uh, capabilities. I think that would be really cool to, yeah. to uh, let users type JavaScript and not have it be a problem. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, Mike Stay talked about um, when you do for x from y p, letting p be written in JavaScript. Oh, wow, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Um, or at least a, um, they've also talked about sort of a uh, Turing, Turing incomplete functional uh, yeah, like a sub language. I, I've yeah. thought about that a little bit too. Doing that in JavaScript would make sense too. I love it. Um, okay, so now I'm trying to figure out how to run this thing. Wonder if there's like an npm install somewhere. Oh, there is. Package.json. All right. Oh, look at that. Clues. <laughs> Perfect. And that's what it's supposed to do. That's not that's probably not what it's supposed to do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is a really current version of Node. Cannot find mod module bundles kernel. Oh well, that's losing. Um, Dan, a skill that I have been trying to learn from you for months and I'm still working on is when I get stuck, just reporting it and moving on and not getting bogged down in one particular thing that I'm stuck on. <laughs> Ooh. So when we do
So, yeah, I might now get stuck or whatever, but the first thing to do is to report the problem. Partly because I'm trying to play a similar role in the Agoric world that I do in our chain, which is, you know, help the core team out and alpha test stuff and be on the boundary between the core team and the end users. Yeah. It's pretty much exactly what my job description is at Parity now too. Mm. So good bug, good bug reports are two thirds of the game, right? Yeah. Have you had a chance to like write down or, or your travels and stuff? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, in terms of like life experience or how do you mean? Or professionally or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. To, to write them down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have, yeah, I definitely haven't like blogged them or anything. I, what I did do is come to the realization that I definitely need to stop using Drupal as my blog platform because it's, it's become so inconvenient that I just don't blog anymore. <laughs> I just recently got myself out of the trap. Did I mention that? Yeah, we talked about it a little bit and uh, your, your optimism was disproportionate to mine. And so I wanted to wait and see how it went. <laughs> it sounds yeah, like pick, good though. Pick any static, static site generator, you know, put your stuff in there and then put it in Netlify. My experience yeah. was, did, it, did you see the blog I am? Um, maybe. Holy shnikes, it worked first try with no tweaks whatsoever. <laughs> oh, I did not see this one. This is a uh, Netlify deploy HTTPS, huh? Yeah, yeah I'm going to read that. Because I used to have the same thing. It was like, oh, I'm going to write a blog article. Oh, it's going to be a pain in the ass. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, firing up a text editor and making a commit is pretty much the workflow I want. Yeah, and that's what I've got now. They've also got a thing, when I was working with Peter Mormon, we used to be able to look at, you know, you could commit to a branch and it would, it would build the branch and you could look at it experimentally. And I, I have not been able to reproduce that experience, but I'm pretty sure that with a half hour of working hard, I could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right, what generation are we all from? Does anybody know what Holy Shnikes comes from? Uh, one of the Chris Farley movies, right? Yes. Maybe Tommy Boy? Okay. Oh, and speaking of, of uh, Chris Farley, have you seen the Ode to Chris Farley by? Time I don't out. think I've seen that. Uh, By Adam Sandler. Um, oh, resume share. Cool. Uh, so this is a little uh, four-minute video that I recommend to you at some point. Oh yeah, cool. Let me put it in my browser. One of my browser tabs. <laughs> There we go. Pop culture side note. I should add a footnote to that effect. Um, Crockford had one of the first things where you stick JavaScript in it and it tells you whether it's good or, good or bad. What was that thing called? JS Lint. There it is. Yeah. This, um, the global stuff is a JS Lint convention. Oh, okay. And I think it's been picked up by many, many other tools. <clears throat> and the idea is basically like you're, it's best to be explicit about your globals to make sure you aren't using any that you didn't intend to or something. Right. Yeah. If you accidentally make a typo or something, then it becomes a global variable. Yeah. And no, this is not in the Wayback Machine. <laughs> 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 the 
It looks mid nineties because it is mid nineties. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I always feel about e rights, also. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you want to see the the you know the modern version of e rights, it's called Agoric. Yeah. Um, uh, where are we on our agenda? <laughs> Well, I, I, yeah, I, I'm so Dan. I'm happy to pick up as much agoric from you as as I can, and I also would offer to talk a little bit about um, a, a registry design that I've been kicking around that I started thinking of in terms of Roxy, but then I'm trying to find time to propose to the Archain people. Do tell. And actually, Joshi, could you briefly? Uh, I'm a little behind on Roxy as as far as maybe a brief uh, explanation of what it is and how how it fits in with um, our chain, perhaps, or other projects that you're working sure. on. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. You, you you might not be that far behind. I just haven't really done anything on it in in a while, but I'll I'll give you this the spiel anyway. Sure. So basically, Roxy is just a Rolang interpreter and. I started writing it partly to learn and partly because I wanted to be able to run Rolang separately from the blockchain, just as a programming language. Mm -hmm. And then as I was going through it, I started to have a couple ideas that I was like, oh, this might be a nice improvement or a nice thing to try. And so I, I sort of switched it, switched the goal from being like, you know, a perfectly compatible Rolang interpreter to something that's really similar to a Rolang interpreter that has a couple differences that, that I thought were were interesting. The rolling for playground. Yeah, yeah, yep. Cool. Yeah, so so the the couple differences, I mean there's, you know, one big difference you'll see is that Roxy is nowhere near as like complete or workable as the co-op's rolling interpreter. But uh a couple of the that's just, you know, cuz I haven't done it yet or got stuck or something. A couple of the intentional differences one is that rolling as the co-op uses it preserves this distinction between names and processes that comes from RoCalc. And I don't think that's necessary once you've uh, stopped using names as, as like variables. So in, in RoCalc, when you do, you know, for something from some channel, then you go through and you replace every occurrence of that name, something in the continuation. But in Rolang, you, you get variables. So you, you, we don't have to like overload names as these things that are going to be used for substitution since we have variables. And so I've, I've totally removed this concept of like the names are the quoted processes. And instead I've just gone with the channels, like, you know, the, the Rolang channels, the equivalent of the PyCal channels are the processes themselves. So for a programmer, that basically means you don't have to worry about stars and ats anymore. Mm. It's never ambiguous, basically. Exactly. So, yeah, that's like, right. Yeah. 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 And, and Josh is going to put put it on robot.net so that uh, we can uh, we can all play with it with robot. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I hope to have it stable enough. See, it's it's one of those things now that it's something I really care about, but I'm trying to force myself to not prioritize too high because I do want to do substrate stuff too, and probably should. So, but the, the one thing that I wanted to, to talk about now, because I think it's relevant to like OCAP design and, and stuff is this, this registry idea that I had. And so it kind of combines a lot of things we've kicked around before, like the idea of a locker room or something like that. And uh, so, so Dan, if I remember right, one of your complaints about the current Rolang design was that you sort of do have ambient authority that you can like, you know, new standard out anywhere you want inside of a row yeah. contract. Yeah. Um, so, oh, and, and another complaint that I don't know if you've made explicitly, but I, I've made and that always sort of reminds me of something that I thought you might say is that it's pretty easy to do these access control lists when you can verify a cryptographic signature anywhere within Rolang. So my, my idea was basically this, to treat the registry, so the, the registry as it exists in co-op Rolang is this public thing that anyone can look up any registered process. So I wanted to split the registry into two different parts. And one is exactly what I just described. It's just this public thing. Like if I write a smart contract that I want maybe anyone to use, uh, then I register it publicly like that. 
But the other part is this private part of the registry. And when I register something there, it's basically like me setting it aside in my locker so that I still have access to, you know, it'll probably be an unforgeable name or something like that so that I still have access to it the next time I come and deploy code. So I can like look up this thing that I registered in my private registry, use it in future deployments, but not have to register it publicly in the public registry so that, so that everyone can look it up. So basically I'm here's- not sure, I'm not sure that's necessary. I mean, you can have a, a directory that you need to read uh, with a signed message that contains all your contract addresses. Th that's right. I'm I'm try I'm proposing something that solves that same problem in a, in a different way. And and specifically the difference is so Jim, let me make sure I understood it correctly. So you were saying like I can register something in the public registry so anyone can use it. But then that thing I just registered, what it does is it only gives me back my valuables if I send it a proper cryptographic signature. So like Maybe someone else looks it up and tries to use it, but they can't because they can't sign with my key. Right. So it's one extra step. Yeah. It. So yeah. Yep. So so that's exactly the problem I'm trying to solve, and I'm just proposing a, a different solution to it. And it's a solution that allows us to make two nice improvements. And the first one is totally removing all of the signature verification stuff from Rolang. Because the idea is that all the signature verification should be done, what I'm calling at the door, which means on the initial deployment. So the only, so signature verification doesn't happen in Roland code itself. It happens by the, you know, like the node, if we're thinking of a blockchain. And then what happens in Rolang is that you've successfully looked something up if you've produced the correct signature. So by removing all of the public key, like signature verification stuff from Rolang, we remove the ability to make access control lists anywhere within Rolang's guts. And by insisting that all of the lookups have to happen on the immediate deploy, then we've eliminated the ambient authority problem by saying like new standard out is a lookup. You can only do that at the like outermost level of your abs their abstract syntax tree. It must be done on initial deploy. And if you want something deeply nested within your program to have access to standard out or this special name that you looked up or whatever it is, you have to, you know, pass it down there, the, the Rolang way where you like share lexical scope. Well, that's to, that doesn't solve the problems I have with ambient authority. What I want to know is if I, if I call something that it only has access to things that I gave it to, gave to it. Although, yeah. So, I, so if I make a call to something and I don't give it the clock, it can't get at the clock. Yeah, so I, I think it solves that, or I'm, I'm trying to solve that. And if, it, if I don't, I definitely want to want to know about it. So my, my thought was like, oh, well, okay. So actually, Dan, look, maybe the one difference is it only has access. I, I wouldn't say it only has access to things you gave it, but it only has access to things that somebody gave it. So it can't jump out and, and grab the clock itself, the clock would have had to been looked up on an initial deploy somewhere. So that means either the person that deployed the code gave it access to the clock, and then when you call it, it still has access to the clock, or that you had to give it access yourself if it doesn't already have it. I have to think about that. Yeah. I think that, uh, though you've certainly justified, uh, Joshi, uh, what you're suggesting I'm not sure all the restrictions are uh, not without exception. There's an exception to every law, except this law, White Scrubber's law of exceptions. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, so Dan's problem, okay, I'm not convinced uh, needs a uh, an update. If you want to keep track of who you gave a permission to, you would give them a proxy that generates an event that you process in terms of uh, 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 being able to revoke that or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, are you looking at something that does more than that? Dan? I am. I am, yeah. If I, if I you know, grab a square root function. I want to be able to know that it doesn't launch the missiles. Oh yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. 
Yeah, I don't, I, I agree that that's a good thing to want to know. I don't think I'm solving that problem, but right. what, I, what I am solving the problem of is that the square root function will not be able to launch the missiles unless someone who is rightly able to launch the missiles gave the square root function, you know, that, that capability. Yeah, I have to think about designing st systems that way. Because it's pretty clear that when you're writing stuff into the blockchain, you don't own the whole world, so. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I mean, that's, so that, that is a really interesting question too. Like, if I've written some library that I'm claiming is a math library and it actually is a math library, but it also has some Trojan horse in there that, that launches the missiles, you, you want to know, I mean, you want to have a good sense about that before you, uh, before you call into it, right? Yeah, um, I can imagine behavioral types being a solution to that, but I'm not sure how you do behavioral types at runtime. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I agree that that's a problem worth solving, and I acknowledge that that's not the problem that I'm solving. Right. But I, I'm curious, I, I hope that I still am solving a valuable problem that's, that's worth solving. Well, it's interesting because what you're talking about is, is very much like the, um, the rev vault except on steroids. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. So, so the big idea is like, so, so with the rev vault, I think they made this decision of like, we're going to use the key, the signature that's over the whole deployment as like, you know, so this, well, we're just going to be able to know who deployed the whole thing and only the deployer is able to move rev. And I'm saying, yeah, don't make that a one-off for the rev vault. That's a, like a useful concept. In general, we want only the deployer to be able to do blank, where blank is something that only the deployer should be able to do. So, they do expose this thing called an identity token or something like that. Um, oh yeah, that, I think that happened after or just before I kind of stopped following so closely. I'm not sure how that works. But it, it does seem like a, a name-based authority and not a, not a capability-based authority. Um, so, so I'm not sure I can use it in, the, in all the capability patterns. So is, is this something that uh, should be put into the arch, uh, added to the R-chain improvement process? Gashi? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not too familiar with the R chain improvement process. I, it's, it's something that I, you know, would like the core devs to, to consider. I, yeah. I'm trying not to put too much, like my, my attitude is that like, it's something that I want to do and I'm not going to be hurt if they don't make the time to look at it. Cause I think that's a good way to get myself set up for disappointment. But yeah, you know, I, I would like them to at least know, consider the it. Chain, R chain improvement process is identical to the, Ethereum EIP process. Well, except that there's no one running it. Um, Kelly's running it. Oh, really? When's the last time she convened on anything or, or evaluated any proposals? No, she just said that she, she just committed time to that role. <laughs> right. So, so it's identical and accepted that it has no history. Well, and it'll have a history if Joshi enters something into the GitHub. Is it, yeah, where, where it's like github.com slash rchain slash rchain or something different? Um. Well, I, I, here's kind of, here, maybe this is a, a more important place to jump off, Jim. I, I felt like my time, like trying to suggest things to the rchain core team is usually not time that I would later consider time well spent because stuff gets marked as like, you know, out of scope or never acknowledged or, or something. Right. So that's, that's kind of why I was bringing that up here. I thought maybe you guys would be interested in like, you know, doing a little brain teaser about it, which I think right. has happened. Yeah. Like this is well, exactly. Well, what now Rich is leading the effort here to organize us and get, you know, and, and, and with people who uh, into uh, uh, taking notice of the R chain improvement process and everything else. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, well, our chain has to earn our trust is where we are right now. Well, um, you know, I, I think, I think we are our chain, right? Whether we're a club or whether we're a co-op, whatever no, we are, no. we should, we should be organizing. We should be making this stuff work. 
No, I think, you know, no, Josh I, and I, I had put in more of our share and gotten screwed more of our share at times. And so th there are parts of our chain that need to earn our trust. That, right. But, but uh, you know, uh, adding issues is certainly uh, your, uh, your forte. I'm just suggesting the, you know, that when we have improvements to our chain, the right place to put them is in the uh, our chain improvement program. Well, yeah. as long as he puts it anywhere in the public, anybody else can pick up on it. And have you written any of this down, Josie? Uh, it's just yeah. It so it's I have like a that's a good question. I don't even remember how far I got into coding this. I have a repo called JS Roxy where I at least got the structure in place to do it. Um, I could I could share if you want. I don't. I'm not on my normal system though. Well, I can share if you. Uh, yeah. Let me let me send you a link. <coughs> Oops. Uh, okay, here's a link coming, whoops, coming in the chat. Did you see that link come over the Zoom chat? Or I can put oh. it in Discord too. Right, 11 days ago. Yeah, whatever happened 11 days ago was probably not that significant. Okay. Oh yeah, I tried, to, I tried to do a little TypeScript 11 days ago. Cool. Yeah, most of this is, is not TypeScript though. So, some, so inside, of, uh, inside of source is a good place to, to jump off. I recently read that TypeScript will check JS.comments, so. Oh. Yeah, cool. So yours are still called .js. That's interesting. All right. It's not, yeah, uh, I, I, the TypeScript I did is a teeny tiny little bit. Like, there, see that janky crypto.ts? That's the only one. Oh, this, yeah, this is the JS that got compiled from the TS. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Roger. Yeah. So the, the TypeScript isn't that important. So I think a good place to jump in is going to be rovm.js. So um, the, the function fresh is what gives you a new instance of the row VM. So mm -hmm. that allows you to like deploy code and stuff. And uh, somewhere a little bit lower, there's a function or there's a method called like uh, called deploy, I think. Yeah, we, uh, there it is. Yeah, there's deploy. So this is going to take in some Rolang term, and it takes it in the form of an abstract syntax tree. So that's one thing that's a little different from how the, the co-op's implementation does it. The, the co-op has you always interact with the row VM by giving it a string of code, which then gets reparsed on every node. And the reason they do that is to ensure that you haven't taken unforgeable names that you shouldn't have access to. So for example, if, I, if I'm allowed to pass in an arbitrary AST, I might have in there like references to unforgeable names that other people have created. Whereas if I have to pass in a string of Rolang code, the only way to express an unforgeable name is new X, and then I'm guaranteed to be given a new one, not someone else's right. pirated one. And, and that's, a, that's a valid concern. I'm not saying it's not a valid concern. I just don't think it's the best solution. And so the best solution is gonna be when you take in uh, a term, which is an AST, you go through and look for all of the unforgeable names that are in there. And then you, you say, okay, so like I looked through this whole AST, there's a single unforgeable name in there. And so now I have to say, is that unforgeable name in either the public registry or this deployer's private registry? And if it is, we're great, go ahead and deploy this thing. And if not, the deployment fails because they're trying to steal someone else's unforgeable name. So, okay, so let's look at the code here. So um, 143 says if term.tag equals lookup. So I'm each one of my like nodes in my AST has a tag field. Right. So it's basically saying if this is like a, a lookup node. Right. 
and the lookup nodes are the ones that in co-op Rolang are spelled like new standard out parentheses back ticks where you're like assigning a name to something that already exists. So I'm calling those nodes instead of new. And I'm reserving new for the other kind of new where you're just doing new X in, where you're actually creating a new name, not just looking one up. Right. So in this function deploy, it handles lookups and anywhere else there's, there's no, uh, there's no way to do a lookup. So if there's a lookup node nested somewhere deeper inside of your term, that's going to fail because what you see the last thing in deploy here. So like it handles deploy handles the lookups and then it goes, it calls par in on line 152 and you can see par in is the very next function that starts on 161. Yeah. And so par in is the more general one. Par in is, is what, well, it's used to par in a term, but it's not accessible to the outside. It's only accessible inside of the row VM. So if you want to get access to it from the outside, you have to go through this like, you know, locker room or checkpoint or whatever, which is the deploy function. And so deploy says, I'm going to handle the lookups. I'm going to make sure there are no unforgeable names stolen. And once that's done, now we're going to this more interior par in one that calls itself recursively over the, the whole AST. Now, so there's no way to do lookups once you're into par in here. What, this, this send star talks about foreign function interface like standard out, which sounds different from what you just described. Yeah, so this is, um, this is describing all of these cases here are, so you can see I'm switching on term.tag. So I'm basically, this is like pattern matching on what, yeah. kind, of, uh, yeah. what kind of term we got in here. And then what happens in here is just how we execute those. So there, so that case on 171, we, we may have to execute sends on something like standard out, but that doesn't mean we looked up standard out there. We had to look up standard oh, okay. out back in deploy. And then once it's in our environment, we can use it and send messages on it. Okay. And same thing with join star on 184. Is there an attack vector here? If uh, you have bogus code that uh, doesn't check, it's not the deployer's job to to check for whether all of the uh, unforgeable names are legitimately gotten. It's it's this this function called deploy's job. I don't know. I don't think I actually implemented that check yet there. Yeah, I, I don't know if that answered your question, Jim. Sure. Cool. So this does allow you to sort of have unforgeable names that last between deploys, right? Yeah, exactly. So like maybe somewhere in this thing, somewhere really deeply nested, I do new Joshi's capability. Then I can insert it in my personal registry and, uh, and it stays there forever or, you know, or until I delete it. I haven't decided if I want deleting things to be a, a possibility, but let's just say that's not an option. So it stays in my private registry forever. And on any subsequent deploy, I can just use that unforgeable name anywhere in my AST. And in that deploy function, it'll go through, it'll say like, okay, I see you've used an unforgeable name here. Is that available in the public registry? No. Is it available in your private registry? Yes. Okay, it's good. I'm going to let this deploy succeed. It's going to check the public one first. Oh, wait, what? It checks this. Oh, at deploy time, it checks all the, the everything in the AST you're saying. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Because looking things up in the public registry is somewhat expensive. Yeah, well, I, so I think that probably is implementation dependent. I, I don't really know. I, I haven't I haven't put very much thought into performance optimizations yet. I, I, what I was trying to put thought into is coming up with a really nice, clean, like semantics for, for how the registry should work. I would assume that you would have a cache of almost every public name that you use or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the registry right now is implemented as a hash map. Or it's actually, that's a good, uh, how did I implement the registry? I, thinking about it now, I think it should just be a hash set, really. Like it's a set of all these things, all these processes that have been made public. Yeah, it's a map right now. Yeah, it's, it, it, if you're doing 
you know, off-chain stuff, that's one thing. If you're doing it on-chain, you have to make sure people pay for all the computation in they're doing. Yeah, right. That's right. That I have not put any thought into. But I don't, but I will say I don't see why this would be less performant than doing it the existing way. One, I mean, one big thing we're saving is not reparsing the, AS, the, the program every time. Well, you do have to go and check that the AST is right. <laughs> not just in forgeable names. You have to make sure it's right in all other aspects too. Yeah, yeah. So this being an interpreter, <laughs> my uh, solution to that problem so far is that it's just going to crash when it gets to something that doesn't make sense. Right. I mean, it, it has to parse, obviously, but parsing alone doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's valid. Anyway, yeah, um, definitely something to think about. Yeah, yeah. So, so take that. Think of that as like me planting a seed in your in your minds and see if it see if it grows. In the same or in a similar vein, uh, speaking of making sure people uh, pay for the computation they're doing. So I found where did I look at uh, Casper Labs is another. I was looking to see what they do because I, I sort of don't like this idea that you get a name and all your, you kind of have this account and message.sender and stuff like that was rubbing me the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So I happen to be looking around at what Casper Labs does because they have a spec. Um, and where did it go? Uh, contract execution model. Yeah, the session contract. Yeah, all contracts execute in the context of an account. Yeah, I know I'm over my quote. You're going to save it anyway, and that's why I like you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they had this pricing model where you pay two dollars a year, and I thought that's exactly what I want. And now they want they've gotten rid of that pricing model. Anyway, uh, um, so so basically, the the Casper Labs folks have done the same thing. They've got message.sender roughly, and so um, the original the Goric is called what it is because the, of these papers written in the early '90s about Goric computing. Whence the whence comes the term. Um, smart contract. Um, so this is the original, that's where the word, Agor, well, I mean, Agoric comes from the word market in the, you know, in, in the Greek or something like that. But as far as used in computing, um, uh, this is the, so I wanted to find out when, when, you know, when the original object capability gets guys were thinking about paying for computing, did they have message sender in their architecture <laughs> Oh, or something else? And so part of, part of me is like working through this, but it's kind of a big long thing. And so I'm tempted to send mail and say, which part of this paper answers my question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might do that. Um. So when is this paper from? Uh, 88. Wow. Yeah, this was, this is all the motivation why they developed E and object capabilities and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, I have to say as someone who got into this space, like in 2013 or 14 or something, there's a lot more, uh, like, existing research even pre-bitcoin like i've realized that a ton the past year like i was doing a deep dive on leslie lamport's consensus and distributed agreement stuff yesterday there's a lot of relevant research out there right. yeah <laughs> yeah in fact mark's san francisco blockchain week thing he's talking about all, all this stuff and and then he says and then um uh, satoshi nakamoto visited the planet and he, and he borrows the picture from 2001 where the obelisk comes down in the eight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 
yeah, because it's like these guys were thinking about this kind of stuff, and then all of a sudden the blockchain came along and said, oh, that's how you do that. Yeah. Milton Freeman predicted Bitcoin, but he didn't live to see it, unfortunately. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the other guy who Mark Miller published with is, is uh, eh, why am I losing my mind? Uh, the other guy that, that coined the term smart contract. Uh, I know Nick Zabo claims yes. to. Yeah. yeah. Nick Zabo and Mark Miller co-wrote co the paper that where that term was in introduced. And Nick Zabo is hypothesized to be either Satoshi or, or one of a small number of people that's a, that is Satoshi. It still strikes me that the uh, original notion uh, presented here of open, of uh, uh, smart contracts is somewhat in contrast to solidity contracts on Ethereum, which aren't smart and aren't contracts. Well, they certainly are not an object capability system. What was the guy's name we just said again? Nick Zabo. Yeah. He's got all this stuff that people have highly recommended to me and stuff. And then I like following his Twitter feed and the guy is like a right wing nutcase, you know? Yeah. I heard him on a, I heard him on a podcast and you know, he had a few interesting things to say, but I also decided I wasn't going to drink that much of his Kool-Aid. Yeah. <laughs> like, do we have to have, let people shoot our children too? I mean, come on. Hmm. Yeah, he has a significant pop culture profile. Yeah. Yeah, I was depressed and when I found out how much of the how much of an intersection there is between the blockchain community and the people that opened up the world to Donald Trump. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's 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 tricky, man. Like you I, I lean pretty hard libertarian on a, on a lot of stuff and like you can't always come out and say it that way because you get typed immediately as like someone who is carrying a bunch of guns under their, you know, down their pocket and has more in their closet. And yeah, it's, it's hard in a, in an age where people are more interested in the, the one sentence description than like nuanced opinions and stuff. Right. I used to call myself an internationalist libertarian. Now mm -hmm. I call myself a communist libertarian. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, <laughs> Jim, that's a pretty good example of like, a lot of people are going to hear those words and <laughs> immediately have a certain reaction that might not be the one you want. I'll just say briefly that these, this, this area is exactly what's motivated me to hang out in the co-op for the last nine months, with only one of those months sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and I also wanted to point out just earlier to a, not to make this about me, but Jim had made a comment. I haven't renewed for next month. I was actually entertaining an offer from another client. And so I'll probably make a decision this week and reach out for continued sponsorship. But I really can't continue with this, with the co-op without sponsorship. Um, but um, back to the more philosophical point, um, you know, co-op as some kind of intermediary between the corporate form and the state form is, I think, one of the things that makes it interesting. Um, so that basically the work under cooperative, the, in theory, um, the co-op eats its own dog food because we live in a terrarium. We live in a closed system called planet Earth. So looking at some kind of intermediary um, where community is represented as kind of a, um, a representational agent for the people not in the room. Um, that's, that's, I think, um, that's an interesting condition to bring to um, these production processes. So that's what brings me to the conversation. This is all part of a tree off of Nick Zabo. Aren't there other guys, aren't there other things that can be said? 
the Nick Zabo about these technologies and their impact in the context of uh, living on Earth? Jim, where's the paper you wrote about the, the trust metric going top down and the something else going bottom up? Liquid something. Wasn't that in Consensus Collab? You're muted, Jim. Yeah, I've been meaning to do a lot more writing on governance. Uh, you know, I think we come through so many things and I think Greg's vision is so high level. And so, I mean, you know, it's like when you talk about the visions of smart contracts, uh, you know, I come back to Greg, <laughs> which uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, still is the, uh, has, is the one with the largest vision uh, that uh, right now of uh, the people I know of. Um, but, um, the, uh, uh, I think that, you know, the, the wealth of knowledge that's coming together in here, it tells us a lot about uh, oh, there he open. Uh, how we transcend, you know, code is law and, uh, uh, you know, and uh, maintain security and, you uh, 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 and how we govern ourselves or do how we govern our chain and our contracts and whatever. And I think you're talking about liquid democracy and trust metric prototype and Rolang document. Yeah, I got it here. Oh, yeah. I was kind of surprised it wasn't in the, or I didn't see it anyway in the consensus cola. Well, if you go to the governance channel, it should be pinned there. Oh, governance collab, aha. Uh -huh. We have a consensus collab and a governance. Oh, I see, those are different, okay. Consensus is about studying consensus algorithms. I see. Does it say that? Oh, okay, sort of. Yeah, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't realize the multiple interpretations. Uh, yeah, I wrote a sort of book while I was at the web consortium called The Art of Consensus. And, you know, and this relates to, I think, our discussion yesterday in terms of uh, quantum mechanics uh, equals general relativity and the idea of the wormhole communications. Uh, uh, um, there's this top down and bottom up the de sitter and anti de sitter spaces uh, causality and you need both sides in order to have a uh, uh, an evolving uh, system in the you know in the ecology of information I'm, I'm not finding i'm not finding the art of consensus dan yeah unfortunately it's member confidential um uh -oh. I might have gotten a copy of it somehow. Oh, wait, did they publish it? I know the address. Oh, yeah. Um. So I was the editor of this for a long time. Oh, cool. Philip Lager is now the editor. Oh, yep, it's on GitHub. <laughs> That's kind of cool. <laughs> I wonder if they put all the old versions in GitHub. Nope. Oh, this is a beef that I always have with GitHub. I don't know how to jump back to commits from a specific date. I don't know if that's possible. 
I don't know, it's a good question. Well, I think I got to bounce out pretty quick, guys. Right. I think it would be fun to play with the top down, bottom up stuff at some point, actual, both technically and socially. But. Thanks for joining, Joshy. It's great to have yeah. you. Good to see you guys. See you later. Later. Bye bye, Josh. See you, Joshy. So Joshy has uh, offered to uh, sp do, put some sp uh, a little sponsorship in the collab. Uh, so if I wanted to look at this demo, what would I do? The demo. Yeah. Uh, and there's a liquid democracy demo. No, um, we, um, I, we, I could probably find a video where, where uh, the, uh, uh, where, where we're testing the contracts. But no, uh, I'm not a video guy. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the last demo was of was of your voting scripts. With the, your, with the dele delegation as you originally translated from the Ethereum contract. Oh, I see. Okay, so uh, what I've done is I've created a new ballot contract. And yeah, I thought you had something running. Don't you? You're voting. Uh, the the uh, User level macros still need to be completed for the liquid democracy. Okay. And basically, we're working on how we create a community, how we uh, how people request membership, um, and uh, uh, are uh, authorized. And become part of the, you know uh, voters in the community, and th you know that's just general now for overall. Uh, you know I want each each channel really to have their own membership, uh, so that we can have stakeholder groups that vow uh, that uh, vow for each other. You know that vow for each other's. Uh, membership in those stakeholder groups so that we can get stakeholder group sentiment. Um, there's a lot to be done, but uh, uh, right now, uh, once the uh, uh, once the uh, the uh, uh, basic macros are updated properly for the uh, which isn't that much work, but I have a bug right now that I have to find. <laughs> um, uh, uh, we'll have a demo of the liquid markets. So Archie and Europe formally went away. Did the people that were there go away, or is anybody still hanging out? Do you know? Uh, Steve Ross is, is sort of the representative. Um. Um, uh, are changing you at this point. Um, I think also Tim, uh, I'm not sure I say his name, Tim Bessemer. Bessemer, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I think, I think he's, uh, running the Twitter, which switched from Archain Europe to, um, Open Rolang. Yeah, Tim, be, but the, the answer is yes, I think people are hanging out and they're, um, I think they're analogs to collab, uh, for, you know, in terms of community sentiment ad advancing um, language and practices. They, they have a uh, Discord group which has not been active. Yeah. 
in the uh, channel in the main Discord that hasn't been active. Right in the in the co-op channel, the Archain Europe uh, is not uh, in the uh, is not yeah. active. That's they cool. have their own server, which has also not been active. Hmm. I see. Time zones, they, they Nick, mess with things. Nick is also a part of Archain Europe, right? Well, the whole idea of Archain Europe is that it doesn't mess with time zones. They're, you know, physically co-located. Co you know, they're all in Europe. The, the idea is that they would have momentum of their own. Right. I think it's. I think we're sitting here wondering what the connection is to whatever momentum they have, rather than there is no momentum. It would be nice to cooperate with them. <laughs> May 20th, there was an event scheduled. Ooh. Three attendees, that's not very exciting. That's probably about the time that the formal vote was taken to uh, unwind uh, the, the Archain Europe co-op. Yeah, <laughs> not a big motivator. I agree, though. It, it would be great to um, consolidate or at least know what the communication channel is to see what motion there is. So setting aside <clears throat> some of the technical mechanisms that are sort of almost there, but not quite. I could play the game that I used to play in the web consortium. I used to do health checks on groups regularly. Um, interesting. Um, so we sort of did a health check on our chain Europe and didn't come up with a whole lot. Uh, what's a channel or something that anybody thinks is I guess governance is one we know about, and the biggest risk I see there is that, um, Rich, your continuing sponsorship is not identified. I don't know if you, if I should say anything about that on, while we're recording. Do you know if there's a successor likely? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not comfortable speculating, and <laughs> um, even. Uh, Speculating on my uh, sponsorship uh, is conditions may be very different in 48 hours than they are in the moment. I'm just being very open about the moment. Sure. Um, but, you know, so if in terms of uh, going down the path of speculation, in terms of, of, of successors, I mean, I have to say just from this morning's conversation, um, um, Bill, you know, I, I felt, I, I liked seeing Bill's notes from uh, yeah. three weeks ago. And uh, given that he's on staff and thinking kind of holistically um, and in a good position, um, you know, I think, I think he could play a role. I think there's other individuals that at different times in the last few days, I had hoped would play more of a, a point position. Um, but they have, you know, I'm, and they may. You know, there's a board meeting coming up in um, 96 hours, and uh, so there, you know, things may emerge in the next few days about people that are committed in one way or another to um, addressing uh, existential needs in the moment. I think it might be helpful if we uh, were to uh, uh, list the people who are seeking sponsorship for the month of June. Uh, with you know a Bitcoin and Ethereum address, um, and um, uh, so that uh, you know, you know, right now it's pretty much word of mouth that people have been sponsored. Um, whereas if we if we list people, we may find 
some of the whales coming in and sponsoring people they like. No, I'll tell you, it's just a strictly house, housekeeping issue for me to catch up. Uh, I had some other uh, things going on the last couple hours, but I think your suggestion is great. And, and so I'll, I'll look forward to doing that. Um, yeah, I know Raul uh, is looking for sponsorship. <laughs> great. I was not aware of that. And that's good to know. It was good to um, check in with him, get to meet him. Yeah, one of the things that I, it was partly um, on purpose. What's that, what do you call it when you're ignorant on purpose? But in willful or ignorant, it was partly willful ignorance, but in the special meeting process, I did not find out who are the people that really have large investments in rock. Because um, you would think that if there are people that have large investments in rock, we could suggest ways that they can move it around that would actually help the project. Would you be uh, uh, interested in being on the list of uh, people looking for sponsorship, Dan? Um, yeah. Awesome. How about you, Steve? I'm um, busy you know, I've got a project, startup project here in, in Clearwater that's consuming my time. So uh, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, in good conscience, dedicate time knowing that I might be, might be dropping the ball. So uh, it, everything I do is kind of for my own selfish needs of learning about our chain and row Lang and so forth for a, a future application that's related to my project in Clearwater. But um, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I, I'd be dropping the ball. I think if I, if I was uh, taking an active role. So you're, uh, you're fully funded. Yeah. Gary? I would drop the ball. What? You would drop the ball? Uh, yeah. I, I honestly don't know how to do it. I, I, I look to you guys for leadership. Well, you do it by, tra by providing transcripts of videos. You've done, that's one thing you did that was really useful to me. Definitely. Um, I think you do know there's some things you know how to do. He just doesn't want to make a commitment. That's fine. Well, hey, you got some reward this month for, from uh, the collab. Uh, pretty significant because we're rewarding um, members meeting, participation, taking notes and all that. And Josh, he's contributing also to the fund for the collab. So I, I, I don't know, put the, the uh, collab on the list. Sure. And people get, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm retired, so uh, if I was on the list, anything that was donated to me would go to the collab, which is like, pretty much done with uh, the income of my, on my statement of work from our team. People are interested in health checks. Board to co-op is one of the sort of most stressed channels. People have high expectations that are not met in that channel. That one would be better closed, I think. You know, if the board is not gonna engage the community, they shouldn't, it's an attractive nuisance, right? Right. Yeah, I think, I think the, uh, the pers kind of going meta on what you're doing here to look at these channels and evaluate their health. I think that's a good practice. Um, I, I, I continue to think that, um, I mean, you actually convinced me, Dan, that um, Discord had uh, functionality and social position uh, being uh, adjacent to the gaming community. Um, so people are already coming in in the kind of Discord vernacular. Um, 
that I, I think Discord could be a workable um, platform uh, for communication. Um, but we also have a situation where certain segments of the community, including uh, the board and staff, and I think kind of unfairly um, just see Discord as a uninformed cesspool of bad attitudes rather than a potential communication channel with the community. Um, and, you know, partly there's some merit, I think, in that assessment, but I think uh, it, it also is, um, it's misguided. It's, it's cause it's, it could be a, a, it's like a wild horse. It could be domesticated and, and used very powerfully. Um, and would and would be of great benefit um, to all segments of the community. Yeah, you, you, I mean, chat works if you have rather regular rituals like a meeting or something, and if and if you have a, a group memory kind of thing where stuff doesn't scroll into infinity, you can you have a, a wiki or a web page or a issues list or something that you keep. I think maybe chat maybe. Um, here I am committing uh, whether I'm sponsored or not to certain activities. Uh, so uh, maybe looking at uh, chat processes uh, and internal communications processes would be a good focus for the next governance meeting. Um, yeah, you know, our, you know, our research 40 years ago at NJIT showed that channels that don't have facilitators are unlikely to uh, uh, be successful, right? Uh, and uh, you know, maybe any of these suckers who volunteers time uh, could take on facilitation of one or more channels. Okay, so let's think about that a little bit on board to co-op, because that's kind of the one that, that you know people have the highest expectations that are unmet. So if if we had somebody who was interested to play facilitator, that would have to have some bandwidth with the board itself, right? Right. They have to be able to say, okay, that question's really important. It merits some board time or, you know. Yeah, we would have to, they would have, you know, the, uh, it might be that the person is, uh, uh, is appointed by a board member. Well, and then um, this kind of gets back to where we are with this, um, this set of uh, documents that came out of last week's efforts. Um, one of which is uh, the, it has to do with the board processes. Because um, maybe that's where the appropriate place to link some of these board communications. Dan, I'm referring to the kind of, um, the revised uh, comment that you made, uh, it ended up as agenda item A in the governance working group proceedings, but it, it was, it started from your concept of um, uh, pre-published agenda board uh, items of business published agenda uh, 48 hours ahead of the meeting, uh, minutes not produced by the meeting within two weeks, um, then a nullification of uh, business conducted during the board meeting. Um, and then that was paired with an idea that um, uh, a former board member pointed out to me, which was that in the bylaws, there's a position on the board identified as the chair, and the chair could be the one convening the meeting and setting the agendas. Um, well, there is a chair. <laughs> Greg chairs the meetings. Okay, well, there, okay, there could be, there could be a, a different other than the president, um, it could be a COO or- That would be a significant involvement if, Je if Re Greg didn't run the board meetings. Right, right. That would be a significant evolution, I think. Yeah, chairman of the board is the guy who chairs the board meetings and, and decides what goes on the agenda and what doesn't go on. It's a powerful position. <clears throat> so, so, you know, the notion had been uh, that we had a board meet, board member um, co-writing these uh, and co-editing these uh, topic points in advance of uh, Tuesday's meeting um, that uh, that board member did not participate uh, this week in in that process so these are uh, we don't know what relevance they have other than um, <laughs> being able to circulate them publicly 
and take them forward. Um, I see. Oh, that's yeah. <clears throat> so is it but, but anyway, those board so this is all keying off your your point here about um improving um board to co-op communications at a, a variety of levels, either it being it not not it, it wasting everybody's time because this is, isn't actually a communication channel. Um, or if we were to improve it and make it a communication channel, what kinds of elements would we, we put in place? And I think that that's where that, my comments tie back to uh, item A. Because it also relates to uh, the other task of uh, confirming that there are members observing uh, the board meeting and then uh, they would have the response, those members observing the board meeting would take on the responsibility of getting minutes out to the community. Yeah. So there's a whole nest of uh, sort of reforms in uh, process. I think, we, you know, we have to take the issues by the horn rather than eliminating channels, making them useful as a better solution. And, um, you know, there again, you know, it depends on you know, commitment of people to some number of hours a week and then finding a place to, where there's something they want to do that needs to be done from an organizational perspective. So I was thinking about Ian as maybe a, a guide for board to co-op, um, but he's resigned his board role. He might still have some bandwidth for the board, I don't know. He is still on staff as administrative director. Um, so I've just asked him to do something about this, either archive this channel or put a big, nobody's here sign at the top. <laughs> that's a good way. That's a good, that's a good suggestion to force other kinds of action. So that's cool. I could ask him to, to be the moderator. Um, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it's, it's funny with putting, I mean, somebody else made the comment about it. It's, it's maybe unwise to put staff people in some of these positions because they will not uh, take a position that they think might threaten their position with the co-op. Right, right. We so they're, Ian, they're free Ian to talk. Has, Ian has cited the, the issue of conflict of interest being a concern about his involvement. In no, right. Like, no, I'm, I'm saying I'm, I'm offering that at a more right. deep, depersonalized and more functional level. Right. So that was my, that's an action that I think is useful on board to co-op. It would be better if the co-op, if the, if the channel actually, if the board did have, you know, some, some path to, 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 um, up to discord, but given that there's only like three of them or something and they're all very busy, I don't think I'm going to put my hopes too high there. Right, and we call it an accountable path. It should be an accountable path. Right. Um, so another one is members. Members is not as bad, but um, people are pissed off that Greg doesn't participate here. You know, they ask him questions and they're pissed off that he doesn't answer in, you know, in five minutes. I'm like, I don't want the CEO of this organization spending <laughs> all his time staring at the members channel. You know, as far as I'm concerned, he shows up randomly just like the rest of us. Yeah. yeah, I wish I could, I could say that I kept up with the members channel. I don't. <laughs> right. Um, so, so, but it would be good to have a facilitator to say, you know, here's what we expect out of the members channel. It's kind of a random place, you know, cool your jets. Um, I mean, an evolved um, FACU for these channels, you know, an evolving FACU for these Exactly. Channels. Yeah, that's what I meant by group memory. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because somebody comes into the development channel and says, I, you know, I can't trade rock. What do I do? I'm like, that doesn't have anything to do with development, but this has happened before. Where did it go? Right. Yeah, I saw that. Where was the guy? Oh, here he is. Um, 
you know, that doesn't have anything to do with development. Well, it turns out, I think this is the only channel he can get to because the member, he's not a member. And so, mm. yeah. So this, you know, I, I want a little robot that says, you know, robot, tell this guy about the, the, the non exchange situation. Um, or if not a robot, just a web page that has it on there. Um, but I don't know what, I mean, where's, the, did we even put this in the blog? How can we find anything in the blog? This is so depressing. Yeah, the blog's really difficult. And right. then you can do search, right? Uh, you've got searches everything. Uh, sort of. I get all things are node. I don't think that's. No, and you get you get like it it it, sh it shouldn't your search shouldn't have the images. That would be a good sort because then it's, <laughs> you might get you might get fifty items on the page instead of five. I bet Google can do this a lot better. No, I'm, really, I'm pretty confident we have not said anything about the exchange situation on, on the blog. Um, I could complain to Derek about that, but the blog is so bad that it's not a solution to my problems. Um, but I think in the announcement channel, somebody put something about the, the exchange situation, right? This one's supposed to be low bandwidth, except that Derek posts everything that goes to the blog and uses all the screen space. And so, um, please stay vigilant. Oh, Greg, if you would stay vigilant, we wouldn't have it. We would, the rest of us could relax. Um, <laughs> Well, or, or delegated vigilance to people. Right. Yeah. Vigilant. Uh, where is the thing where we said we're we're taking the things off the? What are you? What's this? What's the? What's the issue you're you're seeking to track? Is it um, what what is going on with exchanges or the conversation? Yeah, I mean, if I were going to, I did answer it one time. Somebody asked this question about what's going on with with exchange, and I was able to cite the exact line from the announcements channel, I think. I might be doing creative memory here. There we go. Um, there. So since this guy probably won't be able to find the link, I'll do this. Gentlemen, I'm going to step out, step out at the top of the hour. It was, it was good. I'll see you again. Right. Yeah, I, I need to step out too. Thanks, everybody. Sure. Yeah, thanks for joining. Good to see you. Bye-bye. I should cite my source. So a member's facilitator would be good. I wonder if I would pay money for that. I mean, I hold not a lot of rock. I hold a little bit of rock. And the rock would be more valuable if the member's channel had a guide. So I might pay for something like that. <laughs> Thank you.
Governance is going pretty well, except there's nothing pinned up here. I thought I saw Ian delegate the ability to pin stuff to a few people, but they don't seem to have. Yeah, and if, you know, if we had facilitators from the channel, they would be the people that could pin. Well, they de facto are the facilitators, by my mind. Um, I mean, I look to 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 uh, Rich to facilitate the governance channel for oh negative one more days. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I um, guess I think him, like other people, have committed a small number of hours. <laughs> in any case. Oh yeah, I wouldn't expect more than four hours a week out of a facilitator. Right, but uh, you know, it's a question of, of whether he's going to lead the whole process or not. That would require substantial sponsorship. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, how do we, you know, with the limited time that he's offering, how can we best use him? And that's what we, if we organize, you know, I think we have enough people with enough time to do useful stuff, but uh, uh, sorting that all out is, uh, Our challenge. I've actually seen very few people that are still around that are worth investing in. Unfortunately. Well, no. On the flip side, not everybody has sold their rock. So there's some people still have a bunch a significant investment. It, it would be good to know sort of who they are. And so I could say, hey, look, here's something you could useful you could do to make those things valuable. Well, anyway. You know, we have we've got uh, I guess uh, close to a dozen people that have committed some engagement and whether or not they're supporting their resources that can be used. A dozen people have committed to do something? I believe so. Yeah, you know, they, uh, one way or the other. I mean, if we look in the uh, Governance channel here. Um, Successful projects always have the current state available. Preach, brother. Okay, well, Bill Swan is a given. Um, his community, uh, Gary N. Uh, Where are you looking? I'm just scrolling back in the governance group and for the commitments. Um, okay, some of these aren't actual commitments, uh, uh, except to attend meetings. Uh, Deanna, uh, Kenny Rowe, um, um, 
So the list is starting to get interesting. Are they? Is this group of people doing anything? Oh, here's a list. Uh, Don, Don Slav Salvik has. Right. Uh, uh, now I don't know that all those people. Those people uh, were, uh, yeah, participants. I don't know that they explicitly committed. Okay, if we go back up. Uh, Don, Don Salvek, uh, Axe, so that was May 20th when they were doing that. What happened? I lost where I was somehow. Ooh, and we have some endorsements and stuff. We have a little bit of uh, liquid democracy almost. Yeah, well, I took this from your lead. <laughs> and, it, you know, I mean, Greg's point was that the committee members weren't voted. You know, this isn't exactly voting, but it's showing community support. And nobody is thumbs, thumbing down and showing there's no objection. Yeah, Greg was inconsistent on that point because he's, somebody said, well, this person isn't, isn't elected either. And they said, well, but the board elected him, so he is elected. And then, well, wait a minute, the board elected the, appointed the, the executive committee, so they have the same chain of authority. Anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, and how a committee you know, assigns its member is up to the charter of that committee. Right. Well, the, the point where it, it it's important that they have sort of through channels endorsement is if they can make decisions that bind on the whole co-op. Right. right. Well, yeah, everybody has the right of free association you can make whatever groups they want. But they can't make decisions that bind on other people unless, you know. Yeah, and I think, you know, any committee decision can be overridden by the board or by vote of the members. Yeah, by the vote, vote, vote of 500 members. Uh -huh. Well, that's one of the things I hope to, that we change is, is the uh, is uh, the definition of a voting member. The member agreement requires participation. And uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, the complaint of the rock holders is, is that they pay $20, they can vote. Whereas I've invested thousands and I get one vote. Okay, so it sort of equals the, the, the the, the, the poll if we say that, okay, the member agreement says that you're a participant. A participant involves this, uh, you know, X, or uh, needs to be, uh, uh, needs to be evidenced in some way in order for you to be a voting member in good standing. And that way we get the people who are active to have the vote. Of course, uh, voting itself is participation. Uh, uh, but in terms of feedback to a multi-stakeholder decision process, you know, we, you know, we, yes, technically we're a democracy and in a democracy, we can elect to have a, you know, a, a decision process. So what Greg calls the, multi, the multi-branch governance. Um, and uh, uh, the stakeholder communities, the developers, the DAP develop, the developers, the, the members, the stockholders, the employees, 
uh, 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 the, their sentiment could go into decisions. And we need to cat catalog the issues, proposed actions, the pros and the cons. And the sentiment of the membership, which is informed by this catalog of uh, issues. Uh, is this the one that Nick set up or is he the one, did he just say that this one works well? Uh, where's their, is this the one that has the bylaws? No, wait a minute. There's a co-op in here somewhere, but the Open Collective is not the co-op. Mm. It's one of their things. Well, how do I find the things? Inspiral and other people, you know, basically have said these decentralized organizations won't work. And they can't put up governance systems that don't work. Okay, and you know, I think the, you know the exception to the rule is open source development communities, which it's shown that the personal relationships is what is the indicator of success. And in fact, funding or getting giving money to them. Uh, uh, may not help and may hurt. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, the peer to peer relationships, you now governance, in my view, is really creating an environment that gives people autonomy and uh, develops cooperation by bringing people together that are working on the same things so they can cooperate or they might cooperate, uh, bringing people together that have differing views so they can flesh out the issue and the pros and the cons and that's before it goes to a general election of uninformed people and you get uh, Nick pointed us to some co-op that's doing it right at one point, and I thought I connected with it and am now donating three dollars a month to it. But now I can't find it. All I all I can find is that I'm donating to some Twitter work alike. Cooperatively run corner of the Fediverse, democratically governed by its members. Oh, there we go. Bylaws. Maybe this is the thing I was looking for. Hey guys, I enjoyed it. I gotta run. So uh, have a good rest of your week. Take care. Yep. See you, Jim. Later. Yeah, I joined Social Co op a long time ago. Uh, and so did a lot of people in the Visual Life Collective. Uh, but they basically uh, turned off for almost a year because they had such bad governance issues <laughs> and problems. <laughs> No, so this one's not working either, huh? Oh, how old is this? <laughs> how old is what? Um, my understanding, the uh, this uh, uh, by these bylaws. Let's see, did they update them? <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, they had uh, uh, they basically uh, uh. They basically have problems. Um, uh, there's a lot of horror stories of 
different governance solutions in the digital life collectives that uh, look like such good solutions. And, uh, uh, but didn't work because it's not really about software. It's a people problem. It's not about, you know, sure it's about having protocols, but now the protocols don't have to be software enforced. Um, you know, our, you know, um, in, the, in res the research at NGIT, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, um, it was sort of determined that you know, electronic mail was sufficient communication mechanism for any kind of structured process. And it was kind of had a war between the people that thought the software should control the user and those that thought that the user should have freedom and the norms should control the system. Um, and I think uh, uh, freedom is one, is in my view anyway. So I'm not looking for software that constrains people. I'm looking for how we can enable people. And in facilitating a community, that's what governance is about. These are collectors. You know, what happens is all the peer to peer relationships are the thing that builds the collective intelligence, it builds the collective being. Or are you, or are you the one who doesn't believe in collective intelligence? I don't think so. No, I'm just sort of. We seem to be just slightly below critical mass on a bunch of things. In, in our chain. So, I mean, we had this event on May 20th where a bunch of people said, I've got three hours, and then the three hours hasn't been exploited collectively. That's right. That's right. In, in any particular That's our challenge. That's our challenge, and I was hoping that Rich, Rich and Rich, Rich was willing to take that on, except now he's uncertain about if he's going to continue. So, um, I'm hoping maybe Rao will take it on. Cool. Ugh, time flies. Yeah, I should go do real world stuff. All right, Dan, it's been amazing as usual. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, yeah, take care. We've really given, given this community so much. And I'm glad we have it in the camp. <laughs> You're welcome. Bye for now. Bye.